Welcome to the session, Communications with Non-Human Animals, that will offer new ways of thinking and exploring our communication with more than human animals. My name is Orit hirsch Matsiulas, and I will be the, the convener of this panel. Today's session includes three intriguing presentations. Each paper will be 15 minutes. We also are honored to have with us today Professor Margot de Mello, uh, who will be our commentator. We will end the session with Q&A. If you have a question or a comment, please use the raise hand button during the open discussion stage. So we will turn now to Eva Spiegelhofer from University of Vienna. Please, Eva. Thank you very much, Arid. I'm very happy and honored to be joining you today to talk about uh, the language barrier in multi-species ethnography. So as most of you are surely aware, scholarly interest in the modern human has expanded significantly in recent years. The natural world, the environment, living organisms, great and small, all have entered into formerly human-centered debates. This flourishing interest in the modern human is evidenced by events such as this one, which showcase the fascinating research which is being done across disciplines. It opens up new perspectives and possibilities, embracing a deep sense of being entangled with other life forms. So I would like to use the next 15 minutes to problematize a key challenge that recent multi-species scholarship entails, namely the challenge to adjust existing methods to new research agendas, because these existing methods may prove insufficient for multi-species research, and it therefore calls for a profound re-evaluation of the established and often inherently anthropocentric ways uh, we have been doing research. Each academic discipline surely faces its own conundrums in this regard, so to narrow this topic down, I will focus specifically on multi-species ethnography. The term denotes a set of methods that developed out of ethnographic practice in anthropology. This emergence of multi-species ethnography, as even Kirksey and Stefan Helmreich write, occurred in response to the so-called species turn in an effort to bring in marginal and marginalized species. This is no easy task, however. It is one thing to theoretically recognize interspecies entanglements and co-becomings, yet it is quite another to do justice to the intricate complexity of these webs of life in our research practices. In other words, borrowed from Tom Van Duren, Eben Kirksey and Ursula Münster, it is a challenge to cultivate the arts of attentiveness in our thinking that multi-species studies calls for. So it is very much the sphere of our thinking that I'm concerned with and where I see the actual barrier for interspecies dialogue. In their article, The Emergence of Multi-Species Ethnography, Kirksey and Helmreich already recognized the problem of speaking for others which brings with it a question of representation and voice. Who has a voice and who does not? And who is heard and who is not? In traditional ethnography, other than human animals are seldom fully heard. And the reason given for this, among others, is that they lack the ability to speak. Just as the non in the label non-human implies a deficiency on the animal's part uh, or the animal side, perceiving these animals as voiceless implies a deficiency on their side, the lack of speech, the inability to use language. A long-standing debate in Western philosophy is linked to this linguistic human-animal divide. Uh, philosopher Eva Meyer, for instance, has written extensively about this, and my talk is strongly informed by her work on animal languages. My aim here is to establish a connection between these new directions in thinking about animal languages and the language barrier that we in multi-species ethnography. To illustrate this, I will examine four articles highlighting how each of these addresses the issue of a linguistic chasm between human researcher and other than human research subject. In this, I take my cue from Lindsay Hamilton and Nick Taylor's insightful book Ethnography After Humanism, where they explore alternative methods that could allow ethnographers to overcome their, quote, privilege of language, unquote. 
This matters because the methods we use often predetermine what data and results will be produced. Verbal methods common in ethnographic research are tailored for human participants and they exclude other animals who do not read or write as we do. Hamilton and Taylor thus emphasize that it is difficult but all the more necessary to include animals as active participants in ethnographic research. They address the multi-layered problem of language and animal voices, which lies at the heart of this kind of research. Because if other animals could, in fact, talk to us, uh, we probably wouldn't need to adjust our methods at all. However, what if we accept that it is not possible to interview animals in a traditional sense? Yet if we simultaneously endeavor to practice ethnography that doesn't include them because they do not speak human. What we face here is a challenging tension between what we aspire to do and what we can do as researching humans. While this complicates multi-species research, obviously, and Hamilton and Taylor make the case for ethnographies as well suited to address this complexity due to its qualitative, inclusive, and immersive nature. Now, in their article, Animals, Plants, People, and Things, Laura Octon, Billy Hall, and Kimiko Tanita likewise stress the potential of multi species ethnography to help us broaden our awareness of other life forms. They argue that researchers could turn their uneasiness about the human other animal divide into, quote, speculative wonder, unquote. Language, which the authors mention in passing when they refer to Eduardo Cohn's anthropology of life, is just one signifying system among others in a broader semiotic universe, a universe where multi species ethnographers might encounter signs and signals that are unfamiliar yet not necessarily unknowable. Other than human languages seem to occupy a liminal space of separation, a kind of gap between the human and the non human. For Veronica Puccini Kachava, Africa Taylor, and Mindy Blaze, this gap that marks the quote, potential limits of human perception and communication, unquote, constitutes one of the major difficulties that multi species ethnographers face in the field. It calls for research strategies that incorporate new methods and facilitate attentiveness towards more than human realities. The authors also make use of another key term related to questions about communication and language, namely response. Just as Kelly Oliver proposes an ethics of responsiveness in our interactions with other animals, the authors recognize that how we respond in multi-species settings has an ethical dimension to it. So this already implies that even in the absence of a shared language, some kind of response is possible. In this context, the authors hint at the promise of relationality and embodiment in multi-species research. Both embodiment and relationality are recurrent themes also in Catherine Gillespie's article for a politicized multi-species ethnography. She interprets it as a relational methodology revolving around encounters and embodied experience. Becoming aware of this interspecies relationality, as she calls it, and allowing it to unfold takes curiosity and the willingness to be affected by another. Part of this, Jules B. writes, is questioning our Homo sapiens privilege and how it plays out in multi species settings. She argues that this human privilege often leads us to assess other animals by human standards. And as an example for this, she brings up assessments of animal intelligence. I would add that how we determine their linguistic capacity is another aspect of this. When sweeping claims about other animals and their ability or inability to speak are made, the most common reference point is human language. But as Barbara Noske aptly pointed out, measuring other animal species by, quote, our yardsticks, unquote, is hardly fair and tells us little about these animals' actual abilities. In fact, such circular reasoning that finds language as human language makes it easy to discount any evidence for language use by other animals. Even if we acknowledge this, however, and try to avoid any circularity in our thinking, a language barrier in the field remains that multi-species ethnographers will not overcome simply by theorizing about less 
anthropocentric conceptions of language. And yet, my point here is that this theorizing has an important function in teaching us how to reframe the ways in which we think about the linguistic impediments in multi-species research. Let me draw on one final text to illustrate these different framings and the potentially productive tension between them. Reflecting on multi-species multi ethnography's failure to critically engage with the abuse and ex exploitation of other than human animals, Helen Kopnina calls for a radical anthropology that takes a stance against this systematic violence. Her article therefore involves issues of advocacy and speaking for the voiceless. This rhetoric, even if it is well-intentioned, risks, risks echoing uh, ideas about other animals and their linguistic deficiency, which have long served to marginalize them. For instance, Kognina wonders how anthropologists could advocate for other animals who, quote, can never speak for themselves, I quote. So Kapnina thus stresses these animals' voicelessness in a way that makes them seem deficient compared to humans, even while she is arguing for dire recognition as sentient beings. In fact, the same article includes a paragraph on the communicative abilities of other animals and links combating the violence against them with no longer perceiving them as voiceless beings. Kapnina's combination of these two contradictory stances on animal language struck me as quite instructive. On the one hand, she emphasizes uh, other animals' inability to speak in order to strengthen her argument that we need to speak for them. Yet on the other hand, she recognizes this casting of other animals uh, in the role of voiceless others as part of the problem in the first place. Her rhetoric does uh, sort of illustrates my argument about the need to adjust our thinking about animal communication and language because only then we will be able to see that there are shortcomings on either side of the language barrier. It's not just the animals who do not speak human, but it's also us who do not speak dire languages. While this may seem like an obvious point to make, I would argue that applying it in practice is less straightforward. Now, this means that we need to be wary of phrases often used when speaking for other animals, such as uh, giving a voice to them. If multi-species ethnographers hope to avoid indirectly silencing their animal research subjects, their task should not be to give them voice, since this rhetoric renders them voiceless in a sense all over again. Instead, researchers who watch and listen might begin to appreciate how these animals already speak. They have voices and multi-species ethnographers can try to make these voices heard. And I think that today we have already heard um, and witnessed a couple of very good examples of this kind of research. So just a few more words about how we can go about this um, and the bodily dimension is a good example for this. So in Chilsby's article that I've mentioned, um, the language barrier comes up as a problem and that her students describe, um, whom she cites in the article. And they also describe ways they have found of working around this language barrier, mainly by um, no longer prioritizing verbal means of communication, but focusing their attention on nonverbal cues instead. Several authors have already recognized this potential of nonverbal signs in interspecies dialogue. Sociolinguist Leonie Cornips, for instance, writes that, quote, bodies are part of the semiotic landscape, unquote, and thus she understands language as a multimodal and embodied phenomenon. So Another, I yes? Have two more minutes. Perfect, right on time, that's it. Um, so another example for this reorientation towards the body in interspecies communication is of course, Ken Shapiro's concept of kinesthetic empathy. By way of conclusion, I would like to suggest the following um, about alternative frequently nonverbal means of communicating that are indispensable in multi-species ethnographies. We can either conceive of those as a last resort that we fall back on because other animals cannot participate in our complex, efficient linguistic meaning making processes or we can realize that a whole new universe of meaning opens up before us when we step out of our linguistic comfort zone to engage in interspecies dialogue. There will be failure, of course, and misunderstandings. 
anthropomorphic pitfalls and situations when we feel that language in a narrow human sense would come in handy. Um, but language also narrows our perception and can make us overlook communicative signals that do not fit into our conceptual and linguistic frameworks. So in other words, um, there's no room or little room for often at all speculative wonder in measuring other animals' ability to speak by human standards. And I propose that we can create space for this kind of wonder by reframing how we think about the language barrier in multi-species ethnography and by acknowledging that it is us and not every other spe animal species except us who might still have a thing to or two to learn about communicating across species boundaries. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Eva. That was a fascinating talk and a very important theories about the language barrier. So now we will hear Shani Dro from ELTE. Shani? Hi, just a second. I'll stop start sharing my screen. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm uh, from Israel originally, but I'm now studying at ELTE University. And I'll start with uh, presenting my, oh, why does it not work? Okay, my team members. So my two supervisors, Professor Adam Ekloji and Dr. Claudia Fugaza. And uh, also my team uh, members that are Andrea uh, Simmons and uh, Andrea Tanasi. And this project is part of the Family Dog Project, which is um, a research group dedicated to understanding, uh, to better understanding uh, communication with, um, mostly pet or companion animals. It was um, kind of by itself presented as the Genius Dog Challenge on the social media, which I will also show you, and sponsored by Purina. So um, I think we've already heard a lot about uh, language and we've just, normally I think most people, when they hear about language, they think about communication, but we've just heard a lecturer explaining how language affects the way we think. And it's not only the way that we think, it's also the um, mental mechanisms that are involved, like categorization or um, many different aspects of language that are involved in this. So this sentence was originally a dot because I think if you, the more conservative view is that um, this is a distinct, distinctly human trait, but when, you can also have this from the point of view that um, Dr. Pepperger has shown that there are many aspects of the human language which are also um, shared among other species. And what we are interested in studying in our research is these aspects. So we're not trying to say that animals um, can understand syntax specifically uh, but we want to understand the more broader cognitive mechanisms involved. So why are we studying dogs? Well, they're already recognized as a um, model for studying social cognition for almost 20 years now. They're naturally exposed to human language, unlike um, apes, for example. They also live in our uh, environment and they were uh, the have evolved and they um, in the human environment during the domestication process. There are a few very little cases and up until now documented of uh, dogs that know the names of objects. Um, <clears throat> and each of these studies typically involved only one or two subjects. So there are already a few um, scientific um, evidence for the fact that this ability to learn objects is not very common. And this is something that we have been working on and we have not yet published, but there are also others that already tried this and figured that most dogs are not able to learn object labels. So the aim of this project were, first of all, there was a scientific aim, but the, which we will be discussing here, but there was also a strategic aim to find more dogs that are gifted in this sense in their ability to learn object uh, labels. Because as I said before, previous studies were able to use to work only with one or two dogs. 
And uh, with this, of course, you have a very low validity. So we wanted to find more dogs. So a bit about the background specifically of this experiment. Well, we know that infants, when they go through the vocabulary spurt, they start to suddenly learn very fast words. And this is um, related to many attribute this to a, a qualitatively different way of how they acquire new words. So instead of um, connecting each single word to an object, they suddenly start to understand the whole concept that objects can have a name. And we already know about one female border collie that learned the names of over a thousand toys, but it's important to say here that she was very, very intensively trained with uh, five to six hours a day with professional training that took for years. And um, this is only one dog. So as I said, very low sample size and the mem memory was not tested. <clears throat> so we also know from another study that if the dogs and dogs that know labels of objects are able to learn the label of a new object after hearing it only four times. But here, when the test, when the memory was tested, it decayed really fast, and only after 10 minutes, they already did not remember the names of the new objects. And we know that from uh, studies on actions that dogs can, that are trained on more slow and spaced schedules, remember the actions for longer. So our question is basically, can dogs learn names of objects very fast? And are they able to remember the, these labels for a longer period of time? We expected that, yes, they will be able to remember them because we already have evidence for this. And we also expected that they will be able to remember them because we have evidence from infants that they were able to remember these objects for a long time. Our subjects were, again, not a very large subject pool, but we tried. So it took us two years, two and a half years to find these six uh, word knowledgeable dogs. And they all knew over 20 objects already. In our first experiment, we wanted to see if they can learn the names of six new dog toys in one week. In the second, we doubled the difficulty level. We wanted to see if they can learn the names of 12 new objects. And uh, most owners uh, reported that they used about 30 minutes of training, 15 in the morning, 15 in the evening. And um, <clears throat> you can see here how the owner is doing this. So she's just saying the name of the object and she's throwing it around and asking the dog to bring it. Okay. And uh, here we go into the test. So we had the <clears throat> owner sitting in one room and the toys in another room to have this as clever hands control. You can see here there are a lot more objects than they were than we tested on the floor because we wanted to decrease a bit the chance level. And um, we gave the dogs two, two trials per toy in a random order. So now he's going to ask her for the toy. Super. Okay, yeah, when she gets the toy, she gets, she gets a reward. Normally it's play or a bit of a piece of food. So after two weeks, when the after sorry after one week after the first, second experiment was finished, we put placed all the toys away, and we um, took them away so the dog could not have access to them. And then one month afterwards, we randomly selected six of these toys and we used them in our third experiment, and the other six we used in our second experiment. We basically repeated the experiment again with a bit of variation in the, the numbers of toys on the floor and chance level, but it was using the same protocol. And here we see the results. So we see that the dogs were um, overall, they had a very high performance with about between 80 to 90% of correct choices in the first two experiments. And then um, <clears throat> around 60% of correct choices in the second two experiments of the memory. And if we look in the individ more individually, then we see that the dogs have learned uh, the names of the toys. So 
most of the dogs and to experiment, most of the dogs have retrieved all of the toys. And uh, also in the memory test, we had a bit more, um, we had overall five dogs that retrieved uh, all or almost all of the toys. So what can we learn from this? Well, um, we know our results show that dogs are able to learn uh, names of objects in a rate that is similar to the acquisition rate of 18 month old infants. And we also saw that um, this is uh, comparable with previous studies, but in our study, we did not need very intensive training and it was not done by uh, professional trainers. So this shows that this is possibly something that comes quite naturally to these dogs. And this occurred during social interactions, which are much more similar uh, arguably to the way that infants learn object, na learn names or in general learn language. And of course, as I so showed, they remember the names of the toys for up to two months. And this uh, leaves us with a lot of uh, questions. So what is the learning mechanisms? Um, there were some claims for understanding referentiality or for fast mapping. This experiment did not aim to test these. We just wanted to start and understand this phenomenon, understand the limits and understand how naturally this comes to animals. And uh, these are my references. And thank you very much for everyone, if you, uh, for your attention. If you want to see the tests that we have done with the dogs, you can see them. They were broadcasted live on uh, YouTube. So you can just check out the Genius Dog Challenge and you'll find the actual tests that were run during the experiments. So thank you and I will stop sharing now. Okay, hi everybody. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm, I'm very happy and proud to present the next project, which is very much a multidisciplinary project, which uh, Professor Anna Zamansky and I will be now uh, introducing, but of course we are part of a larger group which uh, does this project. And it actually uh, is concerning two, two things. One is uh, improving literacy among uh, young children with difficulties in literacy uh, and trying to help uh, promote their self-esteem and the, you, by uh, reading to dogs, reading books to dogs, but it's a much larger project than that. And I, we will be showing it. And of course, uh, adding the digital, digital uh, uh, part of it, which uh, is uh, Professor Anna Zamensky's uh, part and is very inspiring and very innovative. So let's start. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a social worker, geriatric social worker and uh, expressive art therapist and uh, pet assistant therapist. So we are trying to combine all these things when we are working with the children in this project. And uh, just to have the proper uh, Hagdara. Mm -hmm. Definition. Definition, thank you. Animal assisted therapy is an intervention to achieve the goal of improving a person's quality of life using a human animal alliance as an essential part of the therapeutic process. And we will be talking now about what we are doing and why we are doing, please carry on. So the important thing is of course that we're all, uh, we're all, all the time talking actually about the human uh, animal bond. And uh, Boosted put it very nicely that uh, everybody can really enjoy the, the contact and the relationship, uh, especially with fuzzy animals, feeling security, secure esteem, understanding, forgiveness, fun and laughter, and of course, love. There's a question, uh, is it unconditional love or, or not? But let's go on with that. Uh, and the fact that actually that the pets don't judge us is part of a, a very important part of it. Another very important aspect, which I think often is not uh, is overlooked and look, not looked at enough, is the effect of touch. And uh, we are talking a lot about modern life where we don't touch enough, where children are not touched because they are not allowed to be touched in their kindergarten or by their schoolmasters. Maybe it will be inappropriate touch. And sometimes we tend to forget how important touch is. And being a dance, a dance therapist, 
I, I want to again to, to, to show how important it is. And we're, we're talking about touch. We are talking about the most important sense in our lives. The sense which is the biggest sense of our five senses and is all over our skin, which is the largest organ of ours. And touch can bring so much comfort and uh, security. And I think, you know, they say uh, one picture is worth a hundred or a million words. So we have these pictures here and I think we can all understand why touch is so important. So please carry on Anna with the presentation. Okay, so this is our project. Uh, the project is Kids Read to Dogs. And you see here photographs from our project and you see a, this is actually a, a photograph of a very bashful child a, reading a story to an 18 year old dog. A, I don't think you can see the dog is even in diapers, which is very <laughs> interesting and interesting the connection. So going from all the, the, the very scientific talk which we had until now, I would like to actually I would like us to understand how important it is for children, first of all, to acquire literacy and to uh, when children do, or even adults don't have proper literacy, they feel very inadequate. And of course, in our world uh, here, we are all scholars and I think we all have, uh, we can read very easily, but uh, people who can't read easily feel very bad about it and feel very inadequate in the world. And I think uh, we, we, ne we never know what starts at all, but we know that, for instance, prisoners, most prisoners uh, have a, pro a big problem of literacy. So it doesn't now matter what started the process. Is it the, liter the difficulty in literacy or other difficulties with that person? But we know that there's a strong uh, connection between people who have difficulties in literacy and what happens to them in their lives. So it's very important for us to help children achieve the literacy. And more important than that, of course, is self-esteem, which can be achieved by the connection with the dogs and with the people who we always have a triad of a dog, a child, a, an adult, and of course, it should be a quartet of a, a book. And um, the fact that the uh, children read to dogs, again, as we say, dogs are very playful. Uh, one of the interesting things about dogs is that they don't lose their playfulness till the end. And we can touch them, we can caress them, and children can project on them. And young children really project that they really think that they're reading to dogs. Um, we do not uh, um, put a stress on the fact that of that the dog understands or doesn't understand the story, but we do put a lot of emphasis on touching the dog because we know that once a child touches the dog, it calms them down using good hormones which are released in the blood system and how much touch can be very good. So we, we have here dogs who come together with the children. Once a week, they come to our special garden. The garden is, a, is placed in a, a, in a home which I actually run, which is a home for people with dementia. And a, it, in a way we are trying to do here something which is much larger because it's, it's also a community a project where children with difficulties come from their school, come to the garden, and in the guard, uh, and the, the adults, the residents can watch them and then be in touch with them once there's no COVID-19, of course. And first of all, the children going out of school and coming into this environment, which is green, which is playful, which is lovely, they really say that they love coming. It's their best day of the week when they come to the garden. And then in the garden, they meet the different dogs. And it's important for us that they meet different dogs at different sizes, different ages. Some are with a species, some are not. And we want them to feel good with the dog. So, it's very important for us that each time a child has a relationship or interaction with a different dog. And then they, they can learn about dogs, they can learn to interact. And in many ways, we also talking about language, we talk to them about the non-verbal uh, non communication which they have with the dogs. So we start with dance therapy and with movement to help them release themselves, to get them acquainted to the place. 
And then each child goes with a dog and a book and a grown up and they read to the dogs. And that's very important for us to put an emphasis that we are not teachers and we do not correct or discorrect them, but we try and help them feel good with the books. And then Anna will talk about it much more about feeling good with the books. When they've finished working with the books, we let them release their energies and they do all kinds of uh, uh, physical and uh, sportive uh, um, activities, activities uh, with the dogs. You see here all kinds of agility uh, areas and it's very good for them. And you see, they learn after we also, we teach them about dogs and very much about a uh, nonverbal communication with the dogs, because this is something we want them to emphasize and to understand and to understand interactions in a better way. And you see how th they enjoy it tremendously. Please go on. And uh, at the end of the, of the sessions, we usually, when there's no COVID-19, of course, the children go with the dogs to visit the elderly. The elderly who have dementia, of course, we couldn't photograph them here, but you see the photograph with the children in Purim, which is when we dress up in costumes, came with their different costumes to make the uh, elderly happy. And then suddenly things change because suddenly here, the children who are so, uh, low in their esteem, they help the elderly with the dementia. And again, it gives them such a good feeling of being able to help people who are in a, in a less good situation than them. And it really is very, very heart filling and warm to see the relationships that uh, happen with them. Uh, when we finish the, the session, we have, of course, summary circle, and we, we also um, fill up feedback forms and decide what to do us. And Anna, now it's your turn, please. Thank you, Daphna. Thank you. So uh, the outbreak of COVID actually halted our pilot last year and also introduced some difficulties into running it this year, uh, which we are, have fortunately overcome now. But the presence of uh, digitalization and Zoom in our lives emphasize that changing realities can also bring new opportunities. So we would also like to discuss the uh, digitalization of uh, reading to, uh, to dogs. So uh, with the advance of model te mobile technology, there is a lot of work comparing digital books to regular physical books. And although the study's uh, results are not very decisive, it's clear that digitalization has a great promise in terms of uh, making the experience of reading much more pleasurable because we have features such as text highlighting and taking selfies and cameras and microphones and mobile technology uh, introduces so much variety into reading. In addition, uh, when the child is reading to the dog, the dog is actually a very passive participant. And we were thinking, whether introducing mobile technology and tablets instead of books could make the dog more involved, for instance, by pressing uh, buttons on the tablet. So in the field of animal computer interaction, there are several works which explored the interaction of dogs with screens. So we use these uh, principles and guidelines in our design of the first prototype of the app. We also grounded our design research into uh, the facets of engagement in digital reading. So uh, these are principles which guide us how to make digital experience of reading more fun and more pleasurable. So they refer to uh, affectiveness, which means making the child feel more connected and more included in the interaction. Uh, creativity, which means that we should let the child add his or her own elements into the story or rewrite the story. Uh, of course, interactive and personalized, so we can use the child's name in the story or the name of his uh, reading buddy, the dog. Uh, the experience should be sustained and shared so the child can share it with other children and he can also choose different options and revisit this experience. So we try to take all of these facets into account when designing our digital uh, storybooks. I'm now going to play a short video showing the, the project. I'm not sure you, you can hear the sound, but uh, I can explain what's going on. Anna, you have two minutes left. Yes. Okay. Okay, I will. Okay. 
So the child oh, enters have, his name. But we can't hear the sound if there is. Yeah, no, it's just music and I will explain okay. what okay, we see. Great. Yeah. So you can see we have buttons for the dog and the dog was trained to push them. And this is our pilot uh, with the children. Okay. So, uh, so our research question is whether by introducing digital storybooks instead of physical books, we make the experience better, more pleasurable, more fun, more motivating, and also uh, which technological elements actually have uh, an impact on the child's uh, interaction. So from the first pilot, we saw that the children who used the tablet was, were really excited about it, and they definitely preferred using tablets over physical books. But maybe this is just an effect that will wear off after some time. They especially liked the feature of personalization. So the story was about them using their name and their dog. And also they really liked taking selfie of the dog and putting it into the story. So uh, another challenge that we faced is that our children, we have nine children from second grade with, with reading difficulties. Uh, the, the, the large gaps in their reading capabilities. So some children can read whole stories, others can only read a few words. So we needed to adapt to their different levels. So you can see here a child using cards. So on the left, physical cards and on the right, the digital cards in the application. So uh, thank you and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Daphna and Anna, for sharing with us your wonderful project with a huge social uh, and moral target. We are uh, very happy to have with us today anthropologist Professor Margo de Mello from Carroll College to share with us her insights. So, uh, Professor de Mello. Are you muted? Okay, I just unmuted myself. Um, okay, let's see here. So first I wanna thank the organizers of this conference, which has been terrific so far, Orit and Lamar and Daphna and Anat and folks who I do not know. Um, this has been a really terrific conference and a great panel. Um, and I'm so glad that this panel was at the end of the conference because in some ways it sort of kind of wraps up, I think some of the other, and certainly speaks to some of the other um, panels that have gone on um, up to now. So I just have a few kind of remarks that I wanna make. Um, and my main piece is it strikes me that the panel that we just heard is about communication with humans, um, um, between humans and non-humans. But I think it's also fundamentally about relationality, either as a goal of the work or as a prerequisite to the work. So I wanna talk a little bit um, about that, starting with Ava's paper, um, which I think again, kind of provides a nice frame for the other two papers. So she challenges the privileging of human language in not just mainstream ethnographic research, but in much of the research into cognitive and emotional capacities of animals. Um, and, and the privileging of human language um, begins with a two-part assumption. Uh, first, that language is the avenue into understanding and or relating to other animals. And two, that non-human animals, by a definition which is entirely circular, do not possess this language or this capacity for human language. Um, and then I would even add a third kind of piece to this set of assumptions that those animals which truly lack a voice in um, both the linguistic sense, but also in the social and political sense. So rabbits, for instance, who are voiceless are then kind of doubly handicapped. Um, um, we also see this, this, this focus on voice. And again, Ava's paper um, um, went into this a bit. Um, this idea that animals are voiceless is super prevalent in the rhetoric of animal protection organizations and has been since the very beginning in the 19th century. Um, um, and, and with the added dimension that A, animals are voiceless and B, it is my job as an advocate to speak for them. Um, and, and again, 
and Ava troubles this. Um, I think it is really, really problematic. It clearly goes back to the history of the Western animal protection movement in Victorian Britain at the height of um, their colonial power. And um, it's clearly seen today in the work of the campaigns and um, the other work of Western NGOs in non-European countries where concepts of animal welfare, rescue, um, and responsibility, personal and social, um, are woven into the fabric of the work, into the fabric of those animal um, advocacy organizations. And often those concepts have no relationship with how the local people understand the notion of rescue or welfare or responsibility, and certainly has nothing to do with how those animals might see those concepts. Um, I was watching a. Um, 2009, I believe it was, documentary called Cat Ladies last night, um, uh, which was filmed in Canada about um, sort of cat rescuers slash cat hoarders. And one in particular, um, to me, seemed almost like a menace. She, her whole goal was to just drive around Toronto and kidnap every feral cat that she could find and bring them home and put them in a cage and all this. And I think that is such an interesting idea of rescue. Um, um, and off an obviously one-sided idea. So um, um, back to Ava's paper, to me, it speaks also to the first panel that we heard on Tuesday, and especially to um, Anu's talk on street dogs in India and Maria and Miriam's talk on dog poop in Brooklyn. So dogs are terrific animals to use when discussing boundaries, property versus personhood and social control because they're the animal who slides across those borders most easily. Um, um, and they are, are also, I would argue, the one animal whose social construction is based almost entirely on relationality and in particular on the relationship with us as humans. It is also the animal with the most reciprocal or mutualistic relationship with humans. So this benefits dogs or at least many dogs in a, obviously a whole variety of ways and was key to their domestication. But it's also, I think, their biggest problematic. If they're defined almost entirely by their relationship with us, then when that relationship goes bad, or that relationship is absent, there is no human present, or is seen as absent or troubled by well-meaning advocates, then the dog suffers. So the Indian street dogs that we heard about on Tuesday challenged the British conception um, that all dogs must be owned. That's your starting point. Um, and so the dog's livability or survivability is predicated on um, not any inherent qualities of the dog. And because they seem to slide out of the notion of property, again, that is why they're problematic. So coming back to today, our second to second and third topics today, or papers today, also deal with dogs. And again, I think that the fact that dogs are um, were the subject in both of the talks has to do with the fact that the again the, the, the dog is constructed entirely um, as a relational as a as a partner to humans. Um, and so in Daphna and Anna's work on animal assisted reading, again, would that work? And we know, of course, there's animal assisted reading with other animals, but how much of it has to do with the notion that the dog, um, um, of course, is unjudgmental and of course is listening to you and of course is loving you unconditionally. Um, I would love to see this work exploring other kinds of animals. Let's look, for instance, at cats who seem, um, you know, kind of judgy. Um, how does that work out if you've got an animal who does and already, um, um, who isn't already interpreted within this lens of unconditional love and support, that kind of thing. Um, um, and also, the, in the talk by Shaney, um, the capacity of dogs to learn human language. So as she pointed out, dogs have been exposed to human language for their entire history with us. Um, so again, it's not the inherent qualities of the dog, but the strength of a, the relationship with humans that seems to me key in, in this kind of work. Um, so again, uh, it, with respect to Daphna and Anna, I would love to see more uh, reading programs with other animals and exploring how the construction of those animals may help 
the reading. Um, and then when we get back to Shaney's work, and I saw this discussion in the chat just now, um, we're talking about, of course, human linguistic concepts when we're talking about the object labels for names of toys. What exactly do labels or names mean to dogs? I would love to see this work start to expand in a very different direction. If we go back to the old British social anthropologists, you know, they would go into a culture, learn the language, you know, to the extent that they could then start to kind of map the concepts in the culture. Can we do that with dogs? Can we understand the, um, the importance of the toy to the dog outside of the name that we attach to the toy. Um, what are toys to them? Are they objects to be owned? Are they property? Are they companions? Are they um, um, objects to manipulate humans? Are they symbols? Are they, or are they something very different? Are they shapes and textures and smells and feelings? And how can we get at that? How can we get at what, what is happening there and what's important there? You know, we've all seen the videos. I just saw one the other day of a dog sitting in front of the dryer, worried, waiting for their toy to come out of the dryer. And presumably it was already in the washer. So we're talking about a good two hour wait probably that the dog has had to do. What's going on with that dog? Is, is the toy a god? Um, um, I've had dogs uh, who've had really special toys. I had one dog who had a, um, um, a, a caterpillar. It was sort of like a fat caterpillar that we called Zyzos and another dog who had a, um, a, a toy called Stretchy Pig. And both of those dogs were devoted to those individual toys. What is it about those toys? So that's kind of the stuff that I would love to see happen more because again, communication to me, it's all about relating. And so I understand that we're trying to understand kind of the mental, um, you know, kind of maps of dogs, but is there a way to do that where we don't start with those human linguistic categories? So, um, you know, if we go, for instance, to the panel this morning and in particular, the talk by Khan Slavatovich, um, where he um, does in vivo research. So research with prairie dogs in the field with their linguistic categories. Clearly, it still uses human categories like syntax and, you know, all that kind of stuff, because we sort of don't have a choice. Um, but I love the fact that it opens up more possibilities for us. Um, and then the final thing I want to say, and this goes back to Ava's paper as well, but it also makes an appearance in Daphne and Anna's is the focus on embodiment. Because I share uh, her idea that this is one way in which we can begin with an uh, assumption of sameness. We both have a body rather than the rather than beginning with the lack of language or the inability to communicate. It reminds me of primatologist Shirley Strum's discussion of the fact of the, of the time when she first peed in front of baboons and the revelation that the baboons finally realized that she was um, sort of human or baboon or whatever you wanna call it. Um, because she allowed herself to be seen doing something that they recognized. So I guess I'm sort of gonna end here with um, the idea that maybe we need to do more peeing in front of other animals and a bit less of watching them pee um, um, in order to try to get a little bit more into some sort of a, of a relationship that allows us to see what's going on there. Um, Sorry that was a bit messy, um, but I would love to open up to comments right now. Thank you so much, Professor Demonia. That was not less than mind blowing. So <laughs> thank you all for your wonderful presentations. And now we will uh, take some questions and comments. And please use the raise hand button if you wish to speak. And I already apologize because I see what's going on in the chat box. I think that we might not have enough time to get all of your questions and comments. So you are more than welcome to raise hand. Or that we will uh, start by reading questions from the chat box. For example, there is one question to Shani, but they see that also Shani was answering as well. 
Um, do you want me to, to try and elaborate a bit about this? Yes. Okay, would so be. I would not say, because I cannot, because I would not get published, that we are studying a human language. If I try to say that, I will not get published. Um, because just, just for the sake of context, can you please say what was the question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll, yeah, okay. So the question was, are we studying this from the human perspective? And now I'm going backwards. So I'm, so I am not studying the ability of dogs to understand language. I, uh, not only because I would not get published, but also because this is not really what I'm, what we are interested. We're interested in this, in very small domain general processes. Now it is true that our um, overall approach is comparative ethology. So we are comparing between species. And in this case, we might be comparing between humans and dogs. And in other cases, we might be comparing between dogs and wolves or dogs and pigs or dogs or whatever. But so, and of course the concepts that we are testing they are from the prospect of the human because I cannot test concepts that I do not understand myself. So if I did not know the concept of categorization, I would not be able to test categorization. I hope this is clear and you understand what I'm aiming for. So if there is a way, if I am unable to do something, I cannot test it. Um, but I can, see it from the point of the animal and not try to say this is better or this is better. So I always say when people are asking me, because I work with a few different species, which species is smarter? I say it's like comparing origins, oranges and apples, or in the same as when I'm trying to compare a human cognition and a dog cognition. It's very, very different. So it is a comparative approach, but it's not comparative the, from the point of view of what's better. It's comparative from the point of view of where did this evolution uh, trait, um, con is it homologous or did it, is it a convergence um, um, evolution? I hope this was kind of clear why I, why I have a bit of a problem from say, saying that we are testing this from the human's point of view. We have to because we are humans, but on the other hand, this is not what we're interested. We're interested in the concepts and how in the mental processes Great. Someone uh, wants to uh, have a question or a comment? Yes, Eva. Just then. Yeah, um, if I could just quickly comment on that, um, because I saw Mimor's question in the chat and I was curious how Shani would, would answer that. Um, and I totally understand, I hope, the, uh, the point you just made. Um, I see why it's also important to frame it, like to frame your research like that. Um, and at the same time, I would also agree with Lemoore still after your explanation that the approach is in a sense language centric because you're not only testing concepts, you're already linking those concepts to labels, like two words. So the dogs need to learn words, which is a very human thing um, inherently. Mm -hmm. so this this is, was probably Lemoore's point and it's also um, something that I am troubled with more or less when I read about this kind of research, while it is definitely fascinating. Um, but there's also this um, thing going on with a dog that learns to push buttons in different colors. I, I can't remember now. I think it's something on the internet. Um, and I was asked about it um, at the another conference. Bunny, and she's a labradoodle. She's on TikTok, and I'm not sure where else. Yeah, yeah. Think... That's that's exactly that's it. That's what I'm thinking of. So there, we have something similar that's not utilizing words. I think not so much. There are words so, though. There are words. Okay. Yeah, I thought it's more shapes and colors. Like with, yeah, the um, image on the button is not the word, but what comes out is the human word. Okay. Yeah. Then it's similar. Can I can I answer this? So. We, I know when you're not a linguistic, you look at language and you think words, but the ability to understand object labels, and I should change the whole presentation to, you mostly include object labels, is not, uh, it's very, very small, very almost, it's, it's a, not so much a big part of, of the human aspect of language. 
because as I understand correctly, if I understand correctly, the basic unit of the language is not the word, it's the sentence. And I really understand your problem with the research of the button pressing because, well, there's no research out there yet. But I understand because from my point of view, this is very limiting the dogs into press it into using really human concepts of love of like they're they're really putting um, concepts and trying to say that the dogs are using this but what I am testing you could equally say that instead of using a word I would use a sound or a, a whatever stimulus you want it's just well until now it's been easier to use words and this is what the dogs already know, but it's definitely an interesting aspect to see if you could use something that's not a word. So again, my point is that words are actually not the basic unit of language and therefore we should maybe think about this more as testing labels. Mm -hmm. well, um, there was a question in the chat box, and we can relate it to another question that Professor DeMello was asking. And the question of Limonchen was, uh, what were the reactions of the dogs to the readings? And it relates to the question, if you were thinking, or if you can work with other animals, not only dogs, and their reactions to the reading. Anna, would you like to answer? Uh, yes, uh, I would. I would like to, to to answer and also ask the the audience a question. Actually, uh, I I would like to raise a point that is uh, also related. I mean, I mean, the dogs that come to our yard, they love the kids, they enjoy, they they clearly are very happy to be there. So uh, I guess the right thing to say is that they do not react to the reading, but they react to to the interaction with the kids whom they love. But actually, it's a very interesting question for me. I also discussed it with uh, Tal Kogman, who is a, a researcher studying children's culture. And I consulted her about this issue. I told her that I'm not very comfortable with the fact that we, we try to act as if the dogs understand what the children are reading. And I asked her, what, how should I behave and what should be our dialogue with the kids? Because, because I, I mean, it's, you know, it's not authentic and it's not truthful to say, okay, the dog is now listening to you and it understands what, you, what you're reading. And actually Tal's advice to me, I loved it very much. She said, you should not be telling the kids what's happening. You should be asking them because kids can use their imagination and you should ask them, what do you think is happening or would you, what do you imagine is happening? And so you should take it to, you know, to the realm of imagination and out of the realm of trying to really put labels on what's happening here and what the dog actually understands. Because I think no one, even Shani cannot answer this question, what the dog understands when the kid is reading to it. But uh, so, so maybe the, the more authentic and truthful thing to do is let the kids just say what they think and let them use their imagination. So I also would like to, to hear your thoughts about it because I mean, of course, dog assisted reading is a very important activity and this is an important role of the dogs and not only dogs, as Margot said, we could use also other animals. Actually, Daphna was using parrots in her uh, in her work, uh, but uh, I mean, what should be the dialogue around this thing? And we, if we are reading to, to the animal, what does it actually mean? And what do we say to the kids? What are we doing? Yeah. So if Daphna or Cipi want to add something, please go ahead. Maybe I'll also add the point of a, in the therapeutic field, the fact that uh, especially young children, they project their, their feelings and their thoughts on the dogs. And we had just last week, we were, uh, we were baffled by a story. Uh, a child took a very beautiful picture because the children can't always read. We decided that what we want them to become more familiar and more accustomed to books. And we just let them decide and tell a story from their imagination. Uh, about a picture which we we brought to them 
And one of the girls was saying that a, a, a terrible story about uh, being afraid. And uh, that, that, of course, the dogs are afraid and they want to run away from the home. And there was their projection of her inner world, uh, which is, of course, very, uh, the world, is, the right world is not problematic, but difficult. And uh, this was her projection. And uh, very cleverly, I think that well, the woman who worked with her didn't, didn't uh, bring it up too much because she doesn't know the, the girl. But of course, afterwards, when we read the story, we spoke to the team of the school. And of, of course, yes, there are problems. And we were, um, we saw how she projected the problems at home, which are known and uh, actually by being treated by the psychologists and, and the social workers and the, the team because her parents are getting uh, divorced and the divorce is a very harsh divorce. And here she was projecting from her inner world on a story that it was really her inner world. And this is where we want to use also the, the imagination, the creativity, but also we learn about their inner world. And because we work together with the school team, we also brought it to their attention. We were very happy to hear that they know about it, that they are dealing with it, and we will still go on seeing what's happening. But also on the other hand, because we want the children to be really happy with books and happy with that, we let them tell stories and we, we want to, um, to bring their creative parts to, to, to be shown. And when they're telling a story, when they're doing movements with the dogs and everything, we, we want to really develop it. And the, the, we were just today, this morning we had also our meeting and we were commenting how happy the dogs were to meet. Uh, the dogs and the, uh, the, the people who come with them always come half an hour earlier. And they were so happy to meet each other and they were lo not laughing, they were running together and they were playing and, and you could see how happy they are. And one of the dogs I bring from my father-in-law. So when I come in the morning to fetch her, she is so happy to climb into the car and to meet my dogs and then go on with the interaction. So we see that it's good for the dogs. And of course, we always have to put uh, attention to, dogs, uh, to the dogs' uh, welfare and see to it that their welfare is not uh, hurt by any way. Thank you very much. I, I have a question to Eva. Um, I think that um, we, we do see the language barrier and we are aware of it now more and more in anthropology, but I always ask myself, what can we do about it as an anthropologist? Like what methodologies can we use and uh, when we reach the field and we would really like to do a, a multi multi-species ethnography actually how do we do it actually thanks so much orit for this uh, question which is probably the major question in uh, multi-species ethnography that um all ethnographers doing this kind of work are trying to answer somehow um, and I really, I take my inspiration from this um, approach that is very embodied, that also draws attention to the need to be more attentive, like to actually uh, watch um, and, and look at what the animals are doing, what they are probably saying um, through their movements, through their posture. There are so many things actually. And, I've come to this from an intercultural communication perspective, and there it is acknowledged that nonverbal communication, even among humans or between humans, plays a huge role when it comes to understanding, but also misunderstandings. If the verbal communication and what is nonverbally expressed doesn't match, there's misunderstandings between humans. And so you, you can see even for us that what going on non, on the non-verbal level is really important. So I think that this is a channel that we, we need to use more and we just need to learn how to attune to that. And that brings me somehow back to what Margot said. And by the way, Margot, thank you so much for your wonderful synthesis of, of our talks. Um, and you said towards the end that we need to do more peeing in front of, of other animals. And, and I couldn't agree more because this is this is the thing. When we go out there and watch them doing what they do, they also look back at us. This is probably something we need to 
be more aware of. They are watching us, they see what we do. And while we are trying to learn about them, we also give them the opportunity to understand us better. Thank you very much. Someone wants to ask a question or make a comment? Because I have more. <laughs> I, I would like to ask Daphna and Anna and Chani about the, the social agency of the dogs themselves. Like you met different dogs with different life stories, behavior, age, temper. And I wonder if you noticed also the differences between the specific dogs and how much, how do you include it in, in your research because there are differences and do you, do you recognize the, the differences and the social agency of the dogs? Yes, uh, Daphna, would you like to answer? Indeed, this is a very interesting question. Yeah, okay. It's very much to the point, your question, of course. And um, so, so we're also a bit baffled about it. We, don't, we, we, we do not want to have a situation where a child reads specially to a specific dog. But again, I can just give you the examples from everyday life. We had a situation with two children who one of them is extremely, extremely anxious, uh, anxious of anything and everything. And in the first time he came to the garden, he was completely closed up and his whole uh, non-verbal uh, communication was completely anxious. He wouldn't talk, he wouldn't make eye contact, anything. And uh, the only way we could work with him was when he worked with another peer of his. And he took, a, he also wanted a very specific dog who was very, who was also very, who was also very anxious. Um, uh, she's, uh, and she's also, she's got her issues too. And uh, today, in, it was the fourth time we were working together. And he took today my dog, who's a very, I don't know how to call her. She's a very dominant dog. She knows what she wants and how she wants. And uh, when we were discussing at the end and I was asking him, uh, well, how was it for you? And he said to me, well, my mother said to me that I should separate from my peer and I should be by myself, not with this friend of his with whom he was completely like this. And I said, and what do you think? And he said, yes, I want to be, uh, I want to, to be alone without my friend and I want to be with this dog. And to see him after only four sessions, completely different, first of all, was remarkable. I'm sorry, there's a woman with dementia here at my door, so she's knocking. Um, uh, so first of all, he was in a completely si different situation, but also the, the interaction of the, the children with the different dogs uh, brings out, I think, other parts of them. And it's very interesting to see now, we, uh, with this class, we haven't had enough uh, experience because of COVID-19 and we've just now restarted our session. But it's uh, today we, we let them, we, instead of them choosing the dogs, we had them take like the dogs' uh, names out of, uh, actually their pictures out of a hat and then had to, they would find the name written down and then go with that dog. And it was very interesting that the children liked it. They liked this kind of, each one was getting another dog and it was a surprise which dog. And it also, they were not anxious to catch the first dog that they see and that they want. Uh, so it's very interesting. And like this one, one boy who wants to work with very big dogs. And then on the other hand, we have this dog who's 18 years old and is completely blind. And you know, when he walks his, his so feet sorry. open up and he's in a, a home, a gala. He's in a, chil in a buggy, children buggy. Yeah. Okay, and, and it's so interesting to see the, to see the diversity, and I think for the children also the diversity of the dogs is important, and we do, and and we, we still have to see how it goes. Yes, that's that's really good. And and Chani, just because we're running out of time, do you want to say one two sentences about it? And to I I can just say that I had six dogs. Each of them had already over a hundred toys. And I needed to specify which toy would be good for, and I needed to buy a hundred toys for each dog. And each one had to find like the toy, because this dog likes this and this dog likes this. It was a headache. <laughs> but 
but yeah, each one of their own personality. Yes, th that's wonderful. So unfortunately, we could continue forever, but our time is up. But uh, we have all of the emails in the book of abstracts, so you can write each other. And thank you very much for your uh, lectures. And thank you, uh, um, uh, Professor DeMello, for your fascinating uh, comments. And we will meet here again at uh, 8.15 for the uh, concluding session moderated by Dr. Kenneth Shapiro. So see you soon. Thank you.